Good evening and welcome back to another live episode of Red Tinted Glasses here on the Red Tinted Glasses studio. Callum can't be with us on tonight's episode but I'm delighted to welcome back um, a guest of the show that's already been on this season and provided excellent insight into the upcoming uh, opponents on this weekend and I hope John won't hold it against me too much um, taking one of his um, regulars off the SFF podcast as well. Laurie Finlayson, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thank you very much, Glenn. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, to be here. And indeed, I hope uh, John, fellow Aberdeen fan, doesn't see me as a bit of a traitor, but it's great to be back. No, great to have you on. And of course, we will get on to the game coming up at Rugby Park um, this weekend as the Dons head to Ayrshire looking to get a, a first league win under Neil Warnock and end what is a current fantastic run that you, you guys are on. But for the first part of the episode, because um, I mucked up hearing what Callum um, said and he is actually working tonight, so he's not joining me to look back on the 2-2 draw against Hibs. You're going to kind of help um, me look back on that as... From from my point of view, um, the the Dons dropped yet more points um, from a, a winning position. A, a game we were a- absolutely comfortable um, at, at one point in until Nicky Devlin decided that he forgets how to defend and, and we concede a, a sloppy second goal. But um, yeah, just for, for me, uh, completely frustrating to see points slip away yet again. Yeah, it must be. Must be well. I can only imagine how frustrating it is for the Aberdeen fans and how frustrating it is for uh, for for Neil Warnock. Because I mean, going forward, Aberdeen look decent. Of course, there's a certain man up front who you know, for for you guys is quite rightfully an absolute hero. And for as long as he's at Aberdeen, you'll you'll idolise him. But at, but at the back, Aberdeen do look ropey to say the least. I mean, I don't know when Nicky Devlin signed. Everyone thought Aberdeen had made a brilliant acquisition, but it just doesn't seem to have worked out. I think he's worked out in a sense, but it's, it's moments like the weekend where, you know, I saw him maybe, you know, getting compared to the fact that, you know, we signed him from Livingston, a team that struggled to, to make the top six on a regular occasion. And if you sign a player from the bottom six, you get bottom six performances. And, that for me was, I, I guess, a, a fair point. But I look at Kel Roos first and foremost, a, a goalkeeper that we signed um, from Derby County. And he did come with some degree of warning from Derby fans. Uh, and ever since the turn of the year, his performances have you know, dipped considerably. You look back at the, the draw against St Johnston, where we had the goal that we conceded. For me, the the equaliser in the home game against Dundee, he's to blame. Uh, and then the distribution that we saw for the first goal um, at, at the weekend is extremely poor. Uh, Laurie, I don't know about you, but Willie Miller on the radio saying that he could have maybe done better and bit sells himself when Martin Boyle runs through on goal. Do you kind of agree with that? Yeah, I would say that's a, that's a fair statement from uh, Willie. I mean... Kilru is a goalkeeper who, who, as you say, maybe did come with a warning from some Rams fans, but he's he's someone who I kind of thought as an opposition supporter again would be would have been a good addition at Aberdeen, but over the past few years has been you know a little bit patchy, and as you say, this year has kind of struggled at least since the turn of the year. But again, distribution does seem a bit of a weak point of his, and we saw it. We saw it all too clearly on on Saturday. I, I think it's quite ironic, given the um, kind of abuse, I guess, online that the Martin Boyle is subject to from Aberdeen fans. Of course, being a local lad, <clears throat> that he opens the scoring, and unlike the the game at Hamden, this time he times the run well to to be on side. Um, and again, we we give ourselves a bit of a mountain to climb, having to come from. 1-0 behind but for me the reaction to the way we went 1-0 down um, was really impressive. I, I do have to agree with, with Neil Warnock's post-match com- comments about the fact that it's the best that we've played under him um, so far 
I know, I know it's only four games, so the, the pool's not exactly massive to judge on, but if we're taking steps on terms of levels of performance, we're going in the, the right direction. Unfortunately, the results still aren't aren't quite there. Um, but I think what is most impressive was the way we react and we get ourselves back into the game. And I know certainly coming up um, this weekend, Laurie, a player that you'll be very wary of, um, although hasn't scored against you guys yet this season, um, is Bojan Miofsky. Um, he'll, I'm sure he'll be looking to um, add to his goals because it's been a couple of games without. But despite not scoring, heavily involved, excellent build-up play and Nicky Devil in the right place at the right time to, to get the Dons level. Yeah, indeed. I mean, Miofsky, I mean, as a player who, as a Kamarno fan, I do kind of get the fear, but it's but as you say, Glenn, we can probably take confidence in the fact that he hasn't found the net again does this season. And on uh, Bojan Miofsky, I mean, and I know Neil Warnock mentioned it post-match when he was talking to the media. I think his words were manslaughter when um, when uh, David Marshall, his goalkeeper, appears to wipe him out. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that Miofsky has um, managed to shake that off all right and unfortunately we'll be um, in line to start against ourselves yeah no i'm sure he'll be be raring to go i think the other thing that it impressed me in the way that we kind of came back into the game was the way we we played uh in terms of moving the ball about against hibs i felt at times we were playing balls over the top for the likes of um boya miowski and, and duke to chase down but these weren't balls that we've seen previously where we were just lumping up the ball uh, in hope rather than expectation you could tell the the runs were being timed from the forward play so I'm also interested to see um, and I hate to sound a bit like Barry Robson um, with the fact that Neil Warnock's now going to have a full in, uninterrupted week um, to prepare for this game coming up at the weekend what that might might mean for him to maybe implement some some ideas and and get a, a solid formation and tactics um lined up because like I said we we saw glimpses of that um on Saturday but again it's we're just not getting that full ninety minute performance yet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, um, what well, last midweek when when you played Motherwell, I mean, it was free down within. What felt like a matter of minutes, you know better than me. It must have been something like half an hour. I don't know. And then of mm. course Neil Warnock has to has to turn to his bench. But he obviously is getting some sort of response from 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 the players and he's just it's it's a matter of time it feels like until until it does click. I mean I I hope that it's not <laughs> that it's not Saturday, but but I mean I have every reason to be confident in Kelly, but I just Hope it's not Saturday, but I know that time is going to come when when the plan comes together. And in recent weeks, you are, or recent games, you are starting to see the likes of Duke be more involved in the game. So I'm sure from my last opinion in this podcast, I was, I was slightly wary of uh, Duke, but he has really been off the boil for a lot of this season. Yeah, and he's, he's certainly a player that Neil Warnock's kind of taken under his wing uh, a little bit. I think um, there, there was a comment from, from Neve McPherson on the, the last episode about <clears throat> kind of the way that Neil Warnock's kind of almost mollycoddling him and, and kind of treating him like a, a father-son role and how Duke's warming to that. And <clears throat> we're getting to see maybe Duke back to his best. Another player, and I know you've got a keen interest in the, the Scotland national team, uh, of course, um, this player's currently captain of the, the under-21 squad um, whose future still remains up in the air come the, the end of the season. Connor Barron, for me, uh, another player personally I, I thought did well uh, at the weekend. I know a player that, that split opinion. Um, for me, there was times he tried too hard on, on Saturday and I can probably see why fans were getting frustrated because there was cheap possession given away. There was a couple of times in the first half where he maybe tried a pass that wasn't on uh, and we gave the ball away to the Hibs player at the edge of the box or allowed Hibs a, an easy attack. But for me, there was a couple of times in the second half 
Um, he reminded me a little bit of Cal McGregor uh, in the sense that when he was running with the ball, he was always looking side to side, looking what was on, who was in and around him, what kind of opposition players were coming towards him. He always likes to, to spray a pass wide. And for me, yes, it doesn't always come off, but he's a player that doesn't look to, to shirk responsibility. And that's a player that, that I want to see in my team not leaving the club uh, in the summer. And um, I just hope that the club can come to some agreement with Connor for him to, to remain at the club. Um, because I think losing a player of that quality, certainly in possession in the midfield, with the likes of um, Graham Shinney aging a little bit, uh, would be a big miss to Aberdeen just now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Connor Barron, whenever I've watched Aberdeen, has looked, you know, mightily impressive. And I mean, captain of the Scotland under 21 is no mean feat. Obviously, it does show that he is, he is a bit of a leader. And of course, considering you're comparing him to Graham Shinney, perhaps yourself, Glenn, and the Aberdeen fans might see him if he sticks around as a future Don's captain. I don't know. But he is, he's someone who, has always done rather well. And of course, there could come a time where you never know. And in Scotland, in this field, you might have Conor Barron and then maybe Kelly's very own David Watson, who may well have, you know, dramatic memories for Aberdeen fans. I yeah. don't know, perhaps. But um, but yes, it could happen. Barron is someone who is really impressive. And I remember not so long ago um, being um, asked about him by a Rangers supporting mate in would he fit in at Rangers? And and that that question kind of did take me by surprise because I didn't think he was really wanting to leave Aberdeen. But you never know, especially if his uh, contractual situation is is up in the air. Yeah, I just hope that he doesn't join the likes of Ryan Jack and Scott Wright and moving to the, the dark side. Uh, I, I was going to say I don't think he would, but well we've seen it happen too many times before recently um, and, and obviously Sam Gordon kind of back in the point where I'm kind of trying to emphasise around Conor Barron where he says he would 100% take an over trying in inverted commas player in Conor Barron over a lethargic squad and I think right now that's kind of the way this team's going we're maybe just trying to do um, to, to do too much um, and again, kind of based on Saturday where he says things seem to be coming together slowly for Neil Warnock, just hope we don't run out of games before um, it, it's all good enough. And I think that's the worry right now for, for Aberdeen fans and for me certainly the worry coming up into the, the game at, at the weekend and quite telling that probably a couple of our big games this season, but well certainly between now and the, the split, come against yourselves uh, in Kilmarnock because... I think for me this weekend it is a key marker to see where we are. Um, a win certainly boosts momentum ahead of a home game against St Johnston and maybe gives the fans a little bit of confidence um, ahead of the upcoming Scottish Cup tie. Um, for, for me right now, that Scottish Cup tie feels very much season-defining for this Aberdeen side. I don't know, for you, I suppose you're probably maybe a bit of a side distraction in your in your hopes for finishing fourth. Yeah, it it does almost feel like a sideshow, although Derek McInnes has made it pretty clear this season that, that he wants to win a cup. He basically said that from from uh, pre-season, so I mean, it does feel like probably, well, both Kelly and Aberdeen will maybe feel like they're in for a realistic chance of, of going, on, going on and running the Scottish Cup. And of course, Neil Warnock himself has been on record saying that he wants a top six finish. And I really a Scottish Cup win because of course, if I'm not mistaken, Neil has never has never got into a final. So obviously he wants to correct that little bit of personal history for himself. It it's tough to call though because I don't think Aberdeen and I might I might annoy some listeners here, I don't know. I, I don't think Aberdeen will manage both of them. You may well if you can, you know, get so turn those draws into wins quickly get a top six finish. But I don't think you'd be able to get a top six finish and win the cup, to be honest. And, <clears> and it's an interesting point it. because I was having this discussion um, with my pal Finlay, who's who's over in Perth, Australia, and I know we've got a lot of um, Aberdeen fans that tune in from, from that part of the world. Um, 
and saying kind of how the the run of certainly results for Aberdeen at this moment in time are really doing us no favors because we'd almost be beneficial going win win defeat win defeat rather than draw 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 um because you pick up just as many points in that in that time i guess the other question i kind of had for you uh, as well because obviously having a killy fan on um before um the game at the weekend the the scotch cup kickoff time was announced the the game will be taking place at 12 15 um on the saturday live on bbc scotland obviously aberdeen accustomed to having to go down to ayrshire for 12 12 30 games sometimes even on a sunday on sky sports look i'm not saying it's about damn time that killy fans make the trip up north it's never nice when a, a set of fans get shafted by by tv unfortunately we knew this was going to be the case when the game was when we get to the quarterfinals and the BBC pick up too and um, because via play will always pick up Celtic and Rangers what what do you think with the, the kickoff time being announced for that cup game do you still think Killy will travel in numbers because I have seen a few replies to the the Killy tweet itself a, a lot of fans maybe potentially looking to make a weekend of of this game yeah, I think I think plenty of Kerry fans will still make the trip to Tordre. I mean, we're always, you know, incredibly well backed. And even I don't have the figures to hand, but even when we were at Tordre last time, which was uh, a midweek game on on a rack on a bleak winter's night, there was still a decent Kerry contingent there. I don't have the I don't have the attendance figures to hand, but I think I think we will still travel in numbers. Of course, the kickoff time is is less than ideal. But I think I think you make a fair comment that I mean Aberdeen have had to have had to travel, you know, down here enough enough times for the early kickoff, including of course earlier in the season when uh, there was there was the one on Sunday. And it's it's hard because obviously the broadcasters are probably tied into these kickoff times, I don't know. But <clears throat> I think I saw someone say as well for anyway. The BBC with the trying not to clash with the the Six Nations coverage as well, so I'm not sure um, how much that's impacted, and maybe they they as I I don't know how much say both clubs had um, in that as well, and I don't know whether Friday night was an option and both clubs didn't didn't agree to the the Friday night either. Yeah, I think it's one of these ones of. I don't really think there was an ideal solution, as you say. It was probably a Friday night, which I don't think was too popular in Yorkshire either. <laughs> it was Saturday afternoon that we've got, and we have um, the obviously a Monday night, which again was would probably be even worse than Friday. Obviously, you know, more people were having to maybe take annual leave, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think. <sighs> I mean, a lunchtime kickoff Saturday or Sunday for me is never, never ideal. But um, K Coasters, who's glad to see you back on the podcast, has said that they've got their hotel booked, so they'll be making the the trip up, and hopefully, um, it doesn't end in the same way that the last trip up, up north ended for 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 yourselves. Um, back on the the game at, at the weekend, and the first half was a, a game where. Again, chances fell for for both sides. Um, Jack McKenzie, a player who's really coming into his own um, in recent weeks, and I don't know if I could say it's maybe too late for, uh, in terms of winning player of the year, maybe up there for top three, because I think Boyan's going to absolutely run away with player of the year. But uh, as I certainly said to Callum, between him and Dante Polvara for for most improved. Um, But Leighton Clarkson, uh, unlucky um, seeing an effort that he had come off the top of the crossbar and Duke lost his footing when maybe shooting was a a better option and he tried to to cut back um, to to give himself more room. There was maybe a couple of times where we were guilty of just trying to be too clever um, and, and I don't know how much that pays down to the fact that kind of the situation we find ourselves in where we're desperate to to get that that result that we're we're trying too hard and i know you've probably 
experience that on on occasion where you'd rather the player just takes on the shot than tries and plays the pass because one pass is one pass too many. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that that at times, even this season to a degree, but more so last, has been a bit of a thing with Kelly. Sometimes, you know, we are we're sometimes guilty of walking it into net. One of the, you know, two exceptions has probably been a couple of goals that David Watson has got, including the one, you know, at Godre and uh, I think it was against St Johnson, where where he just hit it. You know, sometimes. If you don't, you know, if you don't buy a ticket, you're not going to win. You know, mm. as cliche as it is, sometimes just have a go, see what happens. You know, I know you could score a cracker. Yeah, the one thing as well from the first half that I will also say in terms of kind of, uh, not in terms of of Aberdeen was how poor David Monroe uh, and his officiating team were. Um, one one incident in particular. Well, there's actually probably a couple on, on both flanks. Um, Leighton Clarkson was absolutely side down in front of the uh, linesman on the, the main stand side who just couldn't be arsed flagging, uh, I think, uh, and left David Monroe to make the decision. And I'm pretty sure it was Will Fish. Um, Duke got the better of him, passed the ball by, and um, Will Fish absolutely took Duke out. No booking. Uh, and then I think he picks up a booking later on in the second half. There was a couple of cynical fouls again for I think Marcandos was on a booking um I think there was an injury time he makes a, another really poor foul that that is for me a booking um and that's before we even come on to the, the second half VAR decision and again you know I know he was lambasted for the way he handled the Dundee game with the kind of the way Mickey Mellinson was and it not treated when he went down with a head injury there's again a couple of examples um, at the game at the weekend where a couple of players were down with head injuries um, uh, and David Monroe was rather happy to continue playing on, for which for me is is not a good look. The, the good look for me, though, was the way the Don started the second half and a player who was probably not having his brightest of games um, at the time, but can pop up and create a bit of magic out of nothing, was Jamie McGrath, who poked home to give the Dons a 2-1 lead. And at that point, <clears throat> it really felt that things were taking a turn for the better for not only Neil Warnock, but the Dons team. And in a game where a win would have really boosted our chances of... Um, achieving that top six goal that, as you said, Neil Warnock harbours hopes of. At that point for me, there was only kind of one team really there wanting to win that game and a team that was creating those chances. But if you don't take the chances, you're going to get punished. And for me, that was the the frustrating thing. And the, the biggest frustration is the the manner on which we concede the second goal because I don't know I haven't seen it back um to see where the lines were drawn because I was adamant that the Hibs left back is is offside um but offside or not Nicky Devlin you've got to be putting that ball out I mean you'd be going apoplectic if that was um a Kelly player doing that Absolutely. I mean, and, and as cliche as it is, it's a case of, you know, playing to the whistle, you know, it doesn't matter if the head player is offside or not, or if the linesman can be bothered to put his flag up. If if he's not flagged or the whistle's not blown, just just keep going. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's so frustrating as a fan when you see that way, you know, players, players stop just assuming the referee's going to blow the whistle. I mm. mean, of course, only exception problem to that is in the case of, as it's happened with David Monroe, as you say, maybe if there's been a head injury or something. Mm-hmm. You know, if that just happened in normal play, I mean, that is infuriating. And I, and I can imagine, uh, I can imagine Neil Warnock's reaction to players doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that was, uh, you know, Neil Warnock saying after the game uh, as well, that he doesn't need to tell Nicky Devlin that he made a mistake. Nicky Devlin knows the mistake was there and it was it was costly and it you know it was I guess kind of hero to zero for for Nicky Devlin in terms of scoring the goal that got us back into the game at one one and then ultimately being the, the player that, that cost us the, the three points by a, a real poor lapse in judgment um 
and concentration as well because we're not in a position where players can be cocky and, and almost try and fool a, a forward into dummying that they're going to head the ball out and leave it. Um, and I suppose if you're if you're a Hibs fan tuning into this, you, you'd just be delighted that, that Joe Newell remained switched on and didn't drown to, to lay the ball off for, for Hibs to equalise. I, I think as well, you, you know, for me, the, the reaction to, to going 2-2 was adequate, I guess. You know, I can't fault the players for trying to go uh, and win it. Again, for me, in terms of the 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 way that um, Nicky Devlin dealt with that situation, it, you know, John Kilo says our whole defense is a joke and has got no. I, I don't know, John, if you're meaning that the no confidence is in the defense or the goalkeeper, uh, and I just wonder as well because and I'm sure Derek McInnes from because he was up at the game um, in midweek against mid-week, Motherwell, well. yeah. Um, will have seen how nervous Kel Roos was at dealing with balls on top of him or dealing with, with set pieces. I just wonder if if Nicky Devlin didn't want to concede the corner because, again, how poor Kel was at kind of trying to command his area. So just thought, well, if I take a goal kick, we've got less chance of conceding, but um didn't work that way. Do you think that does play a part for defences when they maybe don't trust their keeper as much? They do kind of make unforced errors? Yeah, I think I think it does play a part because, as you say, if you're a defender and you know that your keeper is, you know, poor at, you know, dealing with crosses or dealing with corners, commanding his box, you'll, you, you, you'll probably try to, quote-unquote, help him out by, you know, Avoiding seeing corners ever, but I mean, it just ends up having the kind of opposite, opposite effect. I mean, nervous goalkeepers. They're just. I mean, I'm someone who I'm I'm someone who loves a goalkeeper to, you know, my you know command the area. I mean, Will Dennis, as great as he's been, has never looked the world's most commanding keeper. But like, if you you know. Rewind a couple of years with Kelly in the championship when you had Zach Kamen, who is now, you know, mm. doing really well for St. Bernard to his credit. We always had a goalkeeper who would be, you know, you, you, you knew that that box was basically his. You, you knew that he would be in control of it. And I think, in terms of with Aberdeen and Kel Roos being hesitant to say pieces, I think Derek McInnes will have, have picked up on that as, as we haven't been anyone near as effective from set pieces this year but you know sometimes we can look dangerous from them like at the weekend against Celtic we did come close a few times from set pieces although I do kind of have a theory on that and perhaps when you may be able to help me with others misguided I kind of think uh, Tony Doherty was perhaps key to Kelly set pieces because if you look at Dundee now are they mm. not the best team in the league? Yeah, that's a very, very fair point. Um, he certainly knows how to set his team up well at set pieces and um, you certainly can't rule them out. And uh, Sam Gordon coming in and saying that Kel's drop in form seems to be accelerating. Anytime the ball is remotely heading towards our goal, he's sweating. Um, I never thought I would see a goalkeeper that instills less confidence in me than, than Jamie Langfield did. Um, but but here we are, um, especially any time a ball's put high um, onto him and I just wonder you know I mentioned it after Barry Robson was sacked that somehow Craig Sampson seemed to evade um, departing the club what's he What's he done you know because Joe Lewis declined rapidly when he was at the club and Kel Roos has, has done the same so what is our goalkeeper coach doing to bring on any of these goalkeepers. Um, so when does questions start getting asked to him? And yeah. before we kind of move on to the the game coming up at the weekend, um, Skokes are keeping me right in terms of the, the onside offside, saying Jensen played Hibs onside for both goals. How deep Richard Jensen was for the first goal, fuck me, is absolutely criminal. The way our back, our centre-backs could not stay together in terms of keeping a line was infuriating beyond belief. For me in that first half, Hibbs's success 
and again, I'm wondering if this is something that Derek McInnes and Kilmarnock will pick up on, was how far apart Richard Jensen and Jack McKenzie were constantly. Jack McKenzie a few times as well getting frustrated with the, the lack of tracking back from Duke. But I thought the gap between our centre-back and Jack was was really poor. Um, for me, Richard Jensen is another player that's declined in, in recent weeks. I think he's pretty weak. Um I, look, I, I know folk that, that tune in regularly will know I'm a big fan of Angus McDonald and would have been liking to see um, Angus start after his performance on Wednesday night. I can only assume his lack of match fitness has counted against him. But what I saw from Richard Jensen, I don't really know why we couldn't have put on a calm, composed Angus McDonald for an hour and then given Richard Jensen the closing half hour uh, when it comes to to Angus breathing out his arse um, later on in the in the second half, because again, it, it's costing us goals. Poor, uh, inexperienced play. Um, another, I, I guess, obviously the big talking point at the, the, the in the second half was the the VAR call um, on Boyan Miowski. I just want to get your opinion on that decision, um, Laurie, and the decision not to award um, Hibs a penalty in the first half for the, the handball on Nicky Devlin. I called it at the time, um, live at the game. I, I thought we were in trouble with the Nicky Devlin one. Um, and as soon as VAR started looking at it, I thought, well, I, uh, here's, I know it's coming. I have to say, absolutely stunned to see that decision um, not res- reversed. Um, likewise, stunned not to see um, David Munro at least advised to maybe have a look at the, the Boyan Miofsky one. I, I've so, seen more debate around the Nicky Devlin handball than I have um, Boyan Miofsky taking a punch to the head and or uh, I think a sports scene saying punching the ball onto um, David Marshall's glove which caused the punch to the head. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was surprised as well because if, if memory served me right, Nicky Devlin's arm is up or up in a well, what well, well, the sports team pundit would normally call an unnatural position, and then he does he does motion his arm towards the ball, so it kind of did look like at least in the current interpretation of handball, or at least since last week, anyway. Um, it's it seems that that was going to be a pretty nailed on, nailed on spot kick to hips. Mm-hmm. And, and as for the Marshall one, it's 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 strange. One of them was, one of them was actually intent there. Only one of David Marshall will know, but he certainly, he certainly caught him. And I mean, to be fair, David Marshall was probably lucky that he got subbed off and not sent off. Well, I mean, if you look at that incident compared to who was it that got sent off for yourselves? Was it not against Hibbs? Um, well, we had we had one um, against Hearts where. Will Dennis gets this, I think Will Dennis gets a yellow, um, mm-hmm. and he probably should have got sent off. I think it was one of, one of the ones last week, and, and that was a all night that the, maybe saved him in, in that situation. Because um, I think it was you, you Oda from Hibs, probably Hearts fan, probably Graham Duffy or something. Correct me. I think it was like you Oda, Oda. I think was was uh, was offside, and that's what we thought saved Will Dennis at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like it's it's weird. It just it, it's more proof, and I'm not trying to criticize Will Dennis there, but proof that you know goalkeepers really are protected species. And I mean, you could probably make that argument about Craig Sampson, as you said a minute ago. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'll be honest. You were saying about having little confidence in Jamie Langfield in his time in the Aberdeen goal. I mm-hmm. was the same with uh, Craig Sampson. He said, Kelly, I just never really warmed to him at all. Um, I mean, has Craig Sampson not been named on your bench a couple of times? Yeah, I think he was when... I think that that's actually a, a fair point because I think he's also, well, and maybe not this season, but he was named at, at one stage a uh, player coach because we were that short um, in the goalkeeping department. Yeah, I think certainly last season he ended up um, named on the bench. But the gap... Um, widens to to Dundee in terms of the the Dons hunting for that that top six finish and the the task of getting into the top six moves to to Ayrshire this weekend as the Dons travelled to face Kilmarnock Uh, and Laurie um, was originally on just to to help me do this 
part. Um, but Callum um, was not here. Um, so Laurie has ably stepped in to help me look back at the weekend's game. So thanks very much to that. I just want to, before we come on to the game uh, in depth, I'm just going to pick up a couple of points that were raised um, kind of at the top of the show. I'll just go back onto a couple of comments. Forbes McFarlane saying, when you look at who we still have to play, we should be looking to finish in the top six, even though we've not been at our best this season. Forbes asks, what do we think? Obviously not knowing that Calm wasn't come, going to come on the show. And I'm, I'm kind of interested to hear an outside opinion o- o- on this as well. Personally, uh, for me, it, if we fail to win this weekend, for me, the top six is all but done. Um, I, I know we've still got the game in hand coming up against Dundee, but we're giving ourselves far too much to do. Um, th- the fact that you know, so far under Neil Warnock, we've only managed to beat Bonnie Rig Rose. I'm not criticising Neil Warnock. Just it feels like, once again, we've not benefited from any new manager bounce. But certainly my feeling right now is I can't see that top six finish. But, um, you know, as a, as a non-Aberdeen fan, um, Laurie, do you think Aberdeen can make the top six? I'll be honest here. I don't, I don't think Aberdeen will. However, you've got to... Always to try and be hopeful, of course, Aberdeen will, or Aberdeen are a club who, who in my mind, almost expect to be in the top six. Although, of course, there was, you know, a few seasons where, you know, that didn't, that hasn't happened of, of late. And I, and maybe I'm not necessarily capable of putting um, red tinted glasses on, if you will. But um, Aberdeen are a club who, whose aspirations are, much, much higher than than what looks to be potentially mid table obscurity. I mean, in a way, I hope Aberdeen get top six, but but I mean, it's it's hard because everyone, you know, in that top six has it feels like we're all, all there on merit. Even you know the likes of you know Dundee and and Hebs who are obviously you know pushing as well. Hebs are probably. I feel like Hebs are more of a, you know, are more likely to let up than Dundee are at this point. Mm. And, and to me, from the episode looking in, you know, Hebs are actually quite quite similar to yourselves. And you maybe would have saw that at the, at the weekend. Kind of, yeah. Same sort of problems are all right going forward, but it's but it's the other way where they struggle. And it kind of seems to be similar to Pataudry. Yeah, and I think there was actually a tweet from a Hebs fan at the weekend where it said, we've got... Uh, the nucleus of a decent squad we just cannot get the best out of it um and i guess you could copy and paste that for for aberdeen paul donaldson regular and um, watcher of the show here on, on youtube saying this season we failed to beat kilmarnock st Mirren, hibbs and st johnston home or away and we failed to beat dundee or motherwell at home with that record we don't deserve to be in the top six and a quick question for yourself laurie from paul out of the upcoming two games, if Killy were to win one of them, um, which one would you want? Would you rather the three points this weekend or getting to that semi-final at Hamden? That is, is a tough question. Thank you very much, Paul. It's just, I think, I, I would be tempted to say, now, win the cup game and, and let you have the league game because, and maybe I'm being a little bit Maybe I'm still a bit high from from Saturday, I don't know. And the fact that uh, St Mirren obviously lost to, to Livingston, I kind of feel like we are in a in a rel- in a relatively comfortable position there in St Mirren. Um, so you know what? I'm gonna get us to win the quarter final and hope we can, you know, rate a wrong and get get a win at hand. Oh, that's fair. I'd, I'd be quite happy. Maybe. I'd quite happy to take the three points right now, um, and stop me nervously looking over my shoulder at, at times and and start looking up. So, um, certainly one that I'm sure you know maybe will be the discussion on the the, the trip to the, the ground that this weekend. But I, as I said at the top of the show, Laurie. Kelly unbeaten, just was, well, sorry, one defeat in 13 since the two teams last played um, when, of course, Kelly ran out 1 0 winners. And that defeat was um, against Rangers. And I think, you know, Derek McInnes felt you were unlucky to even lose that game. 
what what would you put down to Kelly's recent run uh, and how impressive it's been? Yeah, I think I think Keith in that run, a lot of things have actually been, you know, defensive solidity, you know, the likes of, you know, Stuart Finley, who's been a fantastic to get him, you know, back on game for the season. I mean, to me, and I'm going to say it, and again, this may annoy some Kelly fans, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> He's the sort of he's the sort of guy that you would have expected to end up at a team like Aberdeen in summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As much as he is, he clearly loves it at Kelly, and this is what he's fought third spell. But he's the sort of guy that I could for Kelly to sign him in the summer, and he's done really well. You know, like him, Robbie Dees, who's hopefully going to be back from an uh, injury this weekend, and, and you know, defensively were solid. And Daba as well, Corey and Daba has been. Has been outstanding as well. You know, defensively, it's a solid base we've really built from. And of course, in recent weeks, we've really, you know, added some kind of star quality at the top end of the pitch as well. You know, with of course Kevin Van Bean coming in, Greg Stewart, a man who's well known to Aberdeen fans coming in as well. And and of course, Marley Watkins is on uh, on a good goal scoring run. I mean, you know. And I'm, and I'm not and I'm not trying to rub it in, but it doesn't it doesn't just feel like kind of, you may be missing Mr. McInnes, I don't know. It just feels like we are kind of slowly becoming like a mini late twenty tens Aberdeen. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly with the levels of recruitment that Derek McInnes is pulling out, you you could argue that. Um, of course, Greg Stewart seemed the most obvious signing for for Killy come the the January transfer window. But the, I think the ability to to pull off um, getting Kevin Van Veen um, is a real coup for for Killy, as you say. Certainly, you know, fighting off St Mirren and for the two of you fighting for that kind of security in the the top six. I think it's an excellent addition um, up top. Um, I just wonder, kind of, well, can't be bothered. Makes a, a comment, obviously, on the the back of um, the the news from from Sunderland today, where Mick Beale has lost his job. Um, Dave, don't even think about it. Um, although I know he did offer Mick Beale the job when he was at Aston Villa before we went on to appoint Jim Goodwin. Would you? be kind of surprised if there was interest from Sunderland in, in Derek McInnes, given the job he's done at Kelly? I mean, g- given the job he's done at Kelly, perhaps no, because, I mean, Derek has been great. Of course, when he when he came in, his, his job was to get it up out of the championship, which he did. And last season was, last season was difficult. And, you know, there was, there was a sizable, you know, about Kelly fans who wanted him gone. I I kind of always kept faith in in Derek, but he's really, you know, won the fans over with, you know, the season thus far. But um as for interest in down south, it doesn't surprise me at all. And I, I'm almost sure that Derek was was linked with some job before. Yeah, I'm Same sure he was in, yeah, during maybe, his time at Aberdeen. Yeah, maybe Maybe when, I don't know, Jack Ross got it, maybe? Yeah, it rings a bell. Um, But I I think that was at the time when they were still a bit of a a basket case club and maybe didn't fancy the the Netflix cameras following him around. But back to kind of Killy and obviously the the recruitment that you did in January, how important was it for you to strengthen in that, that forward area? Because... You, you mentioned about the kind of defensive solidity that the Killy have kind of built on since the the last meeting between the, the two sides, but for me, Killy always seemed to be defensively sound, but really lacking in the final third. There was maybe a bit of a reliance on Kyle Vassell and and to a degree Marley Watkins in the early part of the the season. Now, as you you, you mentioned, Marley's come on to a bit of a game, but Killy now finally have options and quality options up at the, the top end of the park. Yeah, we have really, you know, improved there. And of course, as well, going forward, we've got Danny Armstrong and of course, another former Dawn and Matty Kennedy, who, who again has been great for us. Although I must have, I must have committed some sort of sin. I've never, well, not never, but I tend to not be 
at Rugby Park when Matty Kennedy does something important, like score the winner against Celtic in December. I uh, got the got the Sunday lunchtime game. I snuck out. That was uh, due to be on the radio at HBSA. Shameless plug. And <laughs> literally about two minutes after um, I left the ground, uh, Matty Kennedy scores the winner, and then it was Kelly and Tibbs. You know, maybe three four weeks ago, Matty Kennedy scores, and again. I wasn't at Rugby Park to see it, unfortunately, that day. But I must have, I must have done something to annoy really Matty Kennedy. Oh, that's fine. Then. At least if you're going this weekend, then we know Matty Kennedy won't won't score. And, you know... Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll team Matty for you, but I'll have forward. So, the musical box, they are saying Kennedy seemed lazy and uninterested at Aberdeen. He always seemed pretty good against us, though. Um, yeah. but, but anyway, on to the... Other options for us, Armstrong, he's probably been a bit quieter in recent weeks, but I mean, he will hopefully go into a game. But as for the guys that were brought in January, I mean, Greg Stewart and Kevin Van Veen are just getting up to speed. But having those guys in your squad is fantastic, especially when, you know, Watkins at, what, 32, maybe can't be relied upon every week. And, you know, Kyle Vassell, there's always a little bit of trepidation around Vassell as he, and he seems to still be carrying a bit of a a bit of a kind of niggle niggling injury. Um, mm. and there's always a bit of speculation of does he need to get an operation, et cetera, et cetera. I think it may be a, an old hamstring tear. He seems to be kind of playing through. And maybe when we have all this depth and quality, now is probably the time mm. to send the sale for said operation if he does need it. Yeah, and you know, certainly Danny Armstrong, a player I would love to see. Um, at, at Pataudry wearing the red of of Aberdeen, um, uh, but a player certainly both between him and Matty Kennedy that seemed to to do an impressive shift at, at the weekend as uh, as Killy once again caused Celtic all sorts of problems and it, it's nice that it, it's taken all this time for Derek McInnes to to finally learn how to to beat a and cause problems to a, a Brendan Rodgers side. It's just a shame he couldn't do that in the various cup finals he got um, us to. Um, I, I know Celtic were a different beast back then, but it, it still hurts. Um, when, when we look ahead to the, the game this weekend, <clears throat> given uh, Aberdeen are a, a side in transition, I guess, um, or, or coming certainly to Rugby Park under a, a new manager in, in Neil Warnock, a manager that, as, as people are pointing out, is still getting to know the, the squad trying to work out how to get the best out of this squad. What would be your fears from what Aberdeen are bringing down the road this weekend? Well, as I've alluded to earlier in the show, I think my biggest fear would be would be Bojan. But of course, in terms of you know what what that team of the whole will bring, it, it still feels to me a wee bit like now that you're looking at it, it still feels a wee bit like an unknown quantity almost because we haven't really seen what to a kind of full extent what Neil Warnock is trying to do yet. As you've said, Aberdeen have only, you know, beaten Bonnie Reg and probably lost to Rangers, which was a tough game. And of course drew against, you know, Murrowell and and Hibs. Although the one thing you can really take from all of those games to a degree is that the team are willing to, you know, fight for Warnock, mm-hmm. of course, especially, you know, Last midweek, coming from three down. I mean, mm-hmm. you, prob- you probably thought Aberdeen were dead and buried that night. Yeah. And, and there was probably uh, there was probably some Aberdeen fans heading for the exits. And I was very close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's quite clear that they are obviously buying into kind of Project Warnock. But mm. obviously, we're yet to see kind of fully what he wants to do. I think. I think if he can sort of defend out, we'll start to see truly what a Warnock Aberdeen team looks like. But as I think a commenter said earlier on, <clears throat> won't it be just too little too late? Yeah, and I, I think it, it, for me that kind of starts this this weekend. And, you know, as Cooks are saying, Mr. Box Office needs to get points on the board rapid. Yes, we've been doing that by putting points on the board with draws but unfortunately the teams above us yourselves obviously some men lost at the weekend but, but Dundee you guys keep winning games so 
we need to be bettering these results if we harbour hopes of of finishing in the in the top six. For me, the biggest maybe positive in the sense coming up to to this week is that Neil Warnock does have that full week to work with the players, but more so work with a defence that just looks shot of confidence. And what I took from the the post-match comments from Neil Warnock um, at the weekend after the Hibs game was that he said that the defence have to be proud to and want that clean sheet. They have to earn that clean sheet. Clean sheets don't just come just given to you on a, on a plate. And right now we're giving goals to, to opposition. We're not making teams earn anything that they're scoring against us. So for me, that's something I really want to see improved going into this weekend. And look, I know Killy are going to have that pace from Matty Kennedy and Danny Armstrong on the wings. They're going to have that physicality from Kevin Van Bain up front if he starts the game. Marley Watkins, we all know what he can bring. You've got, you know, Watson in midfield. We saw already at Pataudry what he can offer, and I'm sure he'll still be bouncing off the walls after grabbing that equaliser at Parkhead at the weekend. This is a killer side for me. Um, look to be going into this game full of confidence and a team that certainly are getting the locals back on side as well because certainly watching sports scene, the atmosphere that seems to be coming through from Rugby Park seems to be improving uh, week by week but also the crowds also seem to be picking up again um, down at Rugby Park. Yeah, I think we're kind of potentially at the start of another kind of mini revolution in East Ayrshire. I mean, we have this season got the um, highest kind of season ticket total since uh, I think it was in the late 90s. Um, mm -hmm. We've hit over 5,000 season ticket holders, which I know maybe to Aberdeen, who will, you know, always get well, well, way more than double that. It's every every single time. But at Kelly, that is a good crowd. Plus, we are starting to see, you know, you know, younger fans come along to games. You know, there's a there's a safe standing section which is filled with a wee ultras group now, section mm -hmm. eight to sixty nine, who you know make a fair bit of noise and are, are often picked up by by the TV cameras now. And you know, stuff like that makes a difference. And when there's when there's an atmosphere around the place, it does it does filter down onto the pitch. I mean, Rugby Park is a good stadium for creating an atmosphere, but only when there is, you know, at least, you know, five, six thousand people in it. When Rosa Park is dead, it's dead. Okay. If you, if you, it feels like it's only yourselves and the seagulls. I don't know if I told you maybe it's that problem, you know, when it's a bit empty, if you're there like, I don't know, like a League Cup game and a friendly like, in July. Mm. All it is, like, you just feel uh, like you're... Uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I certainly think, you know, kind of ahead of Th this weekend you know what what will be interesting is kind of the uh, approach that that Kelly take to this game will Dennett McInnes I don't know if you if you share this that that will maybe look to kind of go for the jugular from the start try and look to exploit that Aberdeen defense that is lacking in confidence will near Neil Warnock try and put his Aberdeen side on the front foot one player, though, that will not be making the trip to Ayrshire, of course, is Pat Habib Gay, who this evening joined Norwegian side Christiansen on loan until July. Um, the Norwegian side get their um, Premiership season underway on the 1st of April, and Pat will spend um, until July with them getting much needed minutes um, under his belt. Um, and when the Aberdeen hospitality industry seems to be closing left, right and centre, I can only put my thoughts with prohibition um, at, at this moment in time um, after the loss of such a regular customer. Um, half a million spent on him to, well, I think it was at one start at Helsinki. I'm just glad I was there. But look, hopefully he gets minutes and, and comes back for Aberdeen in preseason and we see what that money was was well spent on. But yeah. In terms of the approach to the game this weekend, Laurie, how do you expect Kelly to to approach the game from the start? Being the home side, do you expect Kelly to come out on top in terms of like the start of the game? I mean, not result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I would like us to kind of come out like that because I still feel like 
generally speaking, again, Aberdeen, we need to, you know, almost almost correct a few things. Like, of course, I think it was last season where at the Tawdry, um, Aberdeen scored against us from kickoff. And I'm not saying I wanted to score from kickoff, although we practically did do that in the uh, in the Scottish Cup against Dundee. But, like, we, I, I do want us to go out and have a fast start. Don't, don't fear Aberdeen. If, if they want to sit in, they can sit in. But I want, I want us just to go for it. Yeah, well, I don't want us to, to be sitting in and respecting Killy um, in, in a sense. I want us to go there and show kind of Derek McInnes and, and Killy that we deserve to, to be in that top six. We want to be in that top six and I want us to, to, to take the game to, to Killy naturally. Um, I'm surprised it's taken me 55 minutes to, to, to mention this. Um, but of course, the surface will undoubtedly have an impact um, on the game. Um, could be the last time, of course. Um, as you said last time you were on the podcast, Killy are getting rid of the plastic pitch come the end of the season. Um, so it could be the last time Aberdeen play on, on the plastic surface at, at Rugby Park. But in terms of the plastic pitches we've come up against, Aberdeen's record is probably the best um, down in Kilmarnock. Just um, in the last two meetings, Kilmarnock have suddenly found a formula to get the better of us. Yeah, you you know we don't seem to to uh, struggle with the with the plastic surface. And just just quickly, if you assuming you want it put back to grass, just to give you a bit of sad news, do you think it's going to be the end of next season when it gets lifted? <sighs> yet yet to be confirmed because we're waiting on a uh, planning permission from uh, from the council for for our new training ground, which I would say basically looks like a Cormac Park but on a small <laughs> scale. I don't know. I'm assuming uh, Derek McInnes has a fair bit of say over what goes in the training ground. Mm. It's like so similar. You can probably find that online. Yeah. But um, as for the as for the plastic, I mean, I w- I want the grass back as well. For the record, but I do quite I do quite enjoy it against two certain Glasgow teams. You know, yeah, yeah it's just you know keep the pitch nice and dry, sticky. The ball doesn't move. Great. Anyway, <laughs> um, as for New Warner, I don't. I, I've, I've just got this feeling that he won't like the plastic pitch too much. <laughs> Would that be fair? I, I think he'll, he won't like it, but I think he'll also make sure, unlike what we saw from Barry Robson, um, certainly on the opening day of this season uh, against Livingston, where he used it as an excuse, um, it won't be an excuse. Look, there's, yes, not exactly the same surface, but we've got indoor pitches with, with a plastic surface. I just wonder how much Neil Warnock will be looking to maybe utilise some plastic pitches up here to get some of the players familiar with it. Uh, I just think he will have the, the squad as best prepared as he can, but not looking to use any excuse um, if the result wasn't to go um, the way that the, the majority of people tuning into this podcast will be will be hoping um, come five o'clock o- o- on Saturday. But Laurie... Um, Thank you very much for stepping in for the past hour to not only help me look back at the, the weekend's draw over Hibs, but preview the the game coming up this weekend. It's It's been a real pleasure catching up and, and chatting all things um, Aberdeen, Kilmarnock, and um, I'm certainly looking forward to getting you back on the podcast again when the time comes around for the two sides meeting in the Scotch Cup. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure, Glenn. It was, it was no problem at all. Stepping in in Callum's absence. Yeah, seems to be a regular occurrence every time I do this show that I'm having to find somebody to to step in for for Callum's absence. But um, an able deputy. Um, all the best for the weekend, Laurie. I know you're going to a game, so enjoy it, but not too much. And we'll see you next time you're on Red Tinted Glasses. For those that have been watching this video, remember to leave a like, subscribe. It's free to do so. And whether you've been listening on audio as well, um, hit that follow button and feel free to leave a review. It helps spread the podcast far and wide. So thanks very much for the continued support. Until next time.